before the, the coffee break, um, virtual coffee break, unfortunately. So, Frédéric, the stage yeah. is yours. Yeah, let me, let me go to the full screen mode. <coughs> Presentation. Can you see my screen or? Uh, not yet. Hold, hold on a second, yeah. Mm -hmm. Although I su suspect you have superpowers to make that happen pretty <laughs> fast. Hopefully it will happen. Yeah, what about now? Yeah, yeah, yeah we see the screen, but uh, the full screen, not oh. just the PDF. Presentation. What about this? Perfect. Okay, good. So <clears throat> this will be a short presentation. And in fact, it's about a novel tool to analyze interfaces and to bridge the gap between uh, structure-based information and sequence-based information. And somehow, <clears throat> Mar Martin right uh, earlier asked a question about the conservation of interactions between the RBD, the spike, and its targets. And this tool uh, is in fact meant to address this kind of question. <clears throat> Okay, and so this is joint work with a bright student from Polytechnique, Stéphane Béreux, and also a colleague from INRAE, Bernard Delmas, uh, <coughs> who's one, I think he's, Bernard is the first uh, uh, scientist who <coughs> uh, found a, a receptor in human for uh, beta coronaviruses some 20 years back. Yeah, so briefly, what is the context? So <coughs> if you look at uh, all these papers who are addressing the the binding between, let's say, the spike, the RBD, and its target. So, of course, ideally, one would like to predict or to understand where the binding affinity is coming from, which is a thermodynamic quantity. And, of course, so this can be measured. But if you want to, to interact with the system, to, to perform a mutation, etc., to, to predict the affinity of a drug or an antibody for the RBD, so doing the calculation is just impossible at this stage. The system is too complex. If you care for kinetics, let's say the residence time of uh, uh, an antibody on the RBD, that's the same. So this cannot be really predicted uh, as of now. And so in fact, if you look at all these uh, important papers who, who have addressed the study of the system, so you find some analyses which are <coughs> quite often done quite intuitively. And so here I, I'm just picking two examples. So this uh, science paper by uh, Steve Harrison from uh, 2005, where in fact the complex between SARS-CoV-1 and the RBD of SARS-CoV-1 and various AC2 molecules are studied. And so there you have this table where uh, there is a list, we have a list of positions, uh, 24, 27, etc., cetera, and, and a list of amino acids from different uh, AC2s, uh, different amino acids which are interacting with the RBD. So this is like uh, by hand uh, a depiction of the interfaces between uh, the RBD and, and uh, of SARS-CoV-1 and uh, AC2 molecules. And more recently, I picked this uh, paper by Jan Wilson from Science, where uh, <clears throat> Jan, in fact, and uh, his co-authors, they are comparing the interfaces between SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 against human AC2. And so what they have done, they aligned the uh, sequences of the RBDs. And so there, in, in color, they are uh, stressing those uh, amino acids which are important for the interaction. And so, <coughs> So somehow this is uh, again what uh, Martin was alluding to, to what extent is the interaction with AC2 conserved? And so if, of course, one could um, obtain automatically this kind of string, so that would answer the question somehow. And so one issue with all these analyses is that they are not automated. And in fact, if you look, for example, at the amino acids which are reported in these papers, so one from 2005, in fact, I think that they are stressing 14 important amino acids, but in fact, the wall interface is involved exactly twice as much, about 30 different amino acids. And so because the analysis are done by hand, they are not completely systematic. And also there is a question of the alignment, which is done by hand. And another issue is that, in fact, so here we see, uh, for example, in the Wilson paper, we see specific amino acids, but we don't see specific properties attached to these amino acids, for example which uh, secondary structures do they belong to? Uh, are they present in the bound complex, but uh, also in the unbound structures or not? So what is the buried surface area by a given amino acid at the interface, and so on and so forth. And so what uh, <clears throat> one idea we developed, and so this, uh, this is what I'm talking, going to talk about now, is to design an automated representation of interfaces, uh, which should be uh, generic, <coughs> automatic, which should support, um, in fact, a, a sequence alignment uh, mechanism. 
and which should also allow one to stress specific properties. And so in fact, this is what we call the MISAs, multiple interface string alignments. And in fact, a MISA will be essentially, so we can look at the bottom right picture on this line. The MISA will be essentially an alignment of strings. We'll have one string for each um, polypeptide chain. Uh, in a string, we'll have dashes for amino acids, which are irrelevant at the interface and letters which are one letter codes for amino acids for those amino acids present at the interface. And then we have colors which are going to highlight specific properties. And so in particular, so some properties of interest are the following ones. So for uh, an amino acid at the interface, we, we may want to stress the type of secondary structure element which is <coughs> observed in the complex. So this is of particular importance is, for example, one is comparing um, uh, those amino acids in the, uh, in the complex versus the same amino acids in the unbound structures, because in doing so, one can see to what extent the hydrogen bonding network is, is perturbed upon binding. One can, uh, in a similar way, one can uh, color the interface amino acids with a, let's say, a color gradient, which is giving information on the surface area, which is buried uh, by this amino acid upon for formation of the complex. This is of interest because BSA often correlates with delta delta Gs, namely the variation of the binding affinity on a per amino acid basis. Something which is also interesting is <coughs> to stress the variation of um, accessible surface area upon complex formation. Um, this is so because <coughs> in fact, uh, the so-called buried surface area, if you are familiar with it, just uses the geometry of the bound complex, uh, meaning that you compute the surface area exposed by an amino acid in the complex, and you compare this one uh, against the, the surface array of the same amino acids, if you take the geometry of that chain alone, meaning um, outside the complex. And so this uh, information, of course, BSA is oblivious to conformational changes which may happen upon complex formation. And so by focusing on the delta ASA, which I'll discuss a bit more with more details um, uh, soon, in fact, one can also uh, access uh, or capture information about conformational changes. So let me give you a couple of examples just as a teaser to, 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 to see what's going on. So here on this uh, slide, I'm comparing the interface of the RBD of SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 against AC2. And so, <coughs> so the, the structural model uh, in the upper part of the slide shows you, so in cyan, we have AC2. Uh, in red, we have the RBD. So in between these two polypeptide chains, we have uh, a Voronoi interface, which is uh, hinting at those amino acids at the interface. And now once we have identified those amino acids, we can pull them back onto the polypeptide chains. And this is what you see, let's say, on the middle part of the slide. <clears throat> so for example, if we look at the first line, so we have bound to uh, AGF-E, meaning chain E of, uh, uh, in the PDB file to AGF. Uh, and so there we find 29 uh, amino acids at the interface, and then we can uh, go through them. And so you see that we have posit positively charged K and then negatively charged D and so on and so forth. And so if you take a look at this, um, at this string, which is again showing those amino acids present uh, on chain E present at the interface in the complex, you see at a glance that we have essentially uh, five regions the one uh, from 390KDQ, uh, and then the second one, VIY, and then uh, the, the region in the middle from, let's say, 425 to 442, and then we have this uh, <coughs> big chunk uh, uh, on the right-hand side. And so what's interesting, of course, is to, <coughs> to, to compare the, such chains for different complexes. And so, for example, you can compare two chains in the same crystal structure. These are the first two lines. But of course, more interestingly, possibly, you can compare such chains uh, also defined on, in fact, unbound structures. And so this is what, well, this is what we get for, for lines three and four, right? And so here, uh, yeah, here these are chains which are coming from, uh, in fact, um, PDB file 5x58 uh, uh, for, for line number three. And so this is an unbound structure. <coughs> And so here you can compare the, the amino acids and in here the colors tell us, give us information about the secondary structures which are, which are observed. So this is for SARS-CoV-1. And so now if we move to the bottom part, 
<coughs> so this is the same thing, but for SARS-CoV-2. And so here, there are some interesting features which emerge. In particular, if you look at lines three and four, so this is PDB six VXX and six VYB. As you can see now, we are getting stars and underscores. So the underscores are in fact uh, amino acids which are not present in the crystal structure. And stars are amino acids which are present at the interface in some complexes, right? This is uh, what we see on the first two lines, but which are absent from the unbound structures. And so this is a, a very interesting information because it tells us that these regions in the molecule are unstructured in the unbound uh, molecule, but they are structured, they have been seen in the crystal structure in the bound complex. And so of course this is hinting at conformational variability uh, upon complex formation, and this is of course linked to the conformational entropy in particular associated to this region. So this is just one illustration to compare these strings in two cases here, SARS-CoV-1 AC2, SARS-CoV-2 AC2. As a second illustration, <coughs> uh, maybe have you seen this paper, this was uh, three weeks back in science by David Becker, Be David Becker and co-authors, where they have designed <coughs> uh, mini proteins which are binding AC2 uh, at a very high affinity, in fact. And so the way they have designed these proteins is the following. They have used uh, like a template, uh, this long orange helix from AC2, right, which is known to bind RBD. And what they have designed is a set of, uh, is a library of scaffolds, <coughs> uh, possibly in fact replacing this orange helix. And so they have optimized this library of um, designs using Rosetta, and then they run experiments and they selected a few, uh, a few systems which are very promising because they are binding uh, RBD with a very high affinity. And so of course, <coughs> if you look at these papers, so you have affinity measurements, but it's not so easy to, to understand which parts in the molecules which have been designed are binding. And so what we did was to compute uh, the MISAS for the system. So I apologize, this is a bit uh, small for the fonts, but this is quite, as you're going to see, this is quite interesting because, so we have three chunks. The first one here is, um, uh, in fact, um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 RBD bound to AC2. So this is a, a figure we have already seen and we have already noticed that we had essentially five chunks uh, to define, which were defining the binding regions, right? <clears throat> and so now for the middle chunk, we have a, an antibody known as a CR3022, uh, which is also binding um, the RBD of SARS-CoV-2. And so here, if you compare th those amino acids at the interface, you see that, in fact, this is somehow the complement of the amino acids we have in the first chunk. And so we, meaning that in fact, this antibody is not competing at all with AC2. So to say things differently, in using such an antibody, it is not so likely to hinder uh, the formation of the complex between AC2 and, and, and the RBD, because again, it's bonding in a different location. But now, if you look at the third chunk, namely these uh, mini proteins designed by Becker and others, in fact, if you look at the, the uh, regions, uh, um, which are targeted by these proteins, in fact, they are exactly matching those which we have for the complex between uh, the RBD and AC2. And so in other words, these mini proteins, they are really uh, playing the role which is played by, by uh, AC2. They are, uh, on the RBD, they are targeting exactly the same residues. So this is quite an interesting information, I think. Okay, so this was like the appetizer. The construction is uh, quite simple. This is uh, quite straightforward. So I'm just going, going to, to say in a few words how we proceed. So the construction of a MISA, a multiple interface string alignment, runs through two steps. So first of all, for each polypeptide chain, we need to compute an interface string. And then uh, we, have to, uh, we have to align such strings. And then we have to perform the proper coloring. And so practically, for practitioner, practitioners, so in fact, one just needs to, uh, using our tools, to, to assemble a text file, which is listing the PDB, uh, PDB files, right? And, and then the chains in these PDB files, together with the name uh, associated to the chain, for example, in 2AGF, chain E, in fact, is the RBD of SARS-CoV-1. And essentially, that's it. <coughs> okay, so just in uh, using a few words. So how do we systematically find the amino acids at the interface? We are using this um, Voronoi model 
uh, for interfaces I developed a decade back. So, <clears throat> and so essentially we compute the power diagram <clears throat> of the solvent accessible model and we pull back onto uh, the uh, primary sequence, uh, those amino acids which are found at the interface. So this is what you see in the middle slide, right? <clears throat> okay. And now this is of course done on, uh, for a single complex, but if we have several complexes, we need to assemble what we call a consensus interface because we align the interface strings uh, for each complex. And then at a given position, of course, we look at the, what we call the consensus residue, which is the most frequent one found in all the complexes studied, right? And then <clears throat> there is this uh, technical um, uh, slide, which I'm going to skip. Uh, in fact, uh, we have this uh, coding of uh, interfaces, uh, which is using either one letter codes uh, for amino acids or underscores or stars, depending on whether um, the amino acids are present in the crystal or not, and so on and so forth. Okay, so time is running, so let me, let me conclude maybe. If you want to use this, in fact, that's quite easy. So we have a, we have a, a package. And so let me try to click here. If I, is, it, is it going to work or not? Anyway, so you, you will have the slice. And so if you go to this web page here, you will find a precise description of the user manual and you will find scripts which are going to build uh, these representations for you. And there is also a uh, Jupyter notebook in order to, uh, to, to get you started, right? And finally, there is a paper which is uh, describing precisely a few things we have learned on um, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 by running these comparisons and uh, what we're doing essentially, we are uh, revisiting uh, pieces of information <coughs> described in papers which have been published over the past uh, six months. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Frédéric, for keeping the, the timing. Uh, I think maybe Thomas Schicks uh, wants to ask a question, yeah. maybe? No? No. Oh, okay. No, okay, I was, expecting, I was expecting the open mic to, uh, to mean something like that. Okay, so are there any other questions? Okay, Sergey, Grodinin. Uh, hi, Frederick. Nice to see you again. Yes, hi. Uh, I have a connected question. Uh, Voronoi representation of surfaces and proteins is something very interesting from multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. Have you thought to combine such a representation with the machine or deep learning? Huh. <clears throat> uh, to speak frankly, no, because <clears throat> uh, it, it, I think it really depends what, what the goal is, right? So, so here the goal was pretty modest and it was just to get at a glance a presenta representation combining, uh, well, the interface and sequence-based information. Now, deep learning, so what would be the goal? To, 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 to estimate some binding affinity, some related quantities? Uh, uh, there can be multiple goals to detect the druggable sites, to, to detect the druggability, to compare the interfaces, and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think, of course, uh, something interesting would be to what we have not done, uh, and this is uh, again related to Mar Martin's uh, earlier question, to use these uh, strings in order to compare interfaces and their evolution. And also possibly to use these strings because, for example, in, in the previous talk, we have seen MD simulations and we have seen that along a trajectory, the interface is evolving. So of course, uh, by computing uh, the interface string at a given, uh, for each given, uh, for, for each, uh, each frame, we could also compute the evolution of the interface along the trajectory and end up possibly with some notion of entropy associated to to the interface. Yeah. Okay. okay. As a follow up on, on uh, Sergei's question, uh, um, so there's a very rich body of literature being uh, tr currently transposed between uh, point cloud representation uh, for protein surface or maybe RNA surfaces um, and uh, encoding within neural networks in order to do pocket detection and, and, and all that. It's, it's kind of fascinating what uh, advantage could the Voronoi representation or some, some encoding of Voronoi diagrams locally could, could, could have. 
Yeah. In, princ in principle, I mean, the, those are just mesh, those can be encoded by, by meshes. So you could really reuse a, a lot of the equivariant networks out there. Yeah. Um, so, but by the way, so the Hornoy diagrams, they are not, they are not about points here. They are about weighted points, right? Because we are talking about balls whose radii differ. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a bit more complicated. And also, the nice feature is that in a DLNA triangulation, um, the contacts which are observed, either in the DLNA triangulation or in the alpha complex, they are local, local encoding of the interactions, as opposed to having point cloud, because in a point cloud, in fact, you don't specify um, any edge. In fact, uh, so, so potentially the graph is complete, as opposed, in, instead in a DLNA triangulation, you favor local contacts. And so it's true that this could be exploited in these uh, yeah, learning machines. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a little? May I ask a little question? Of course, of course. Very short. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know whether uh, what you set up is just for proteins, or it would work also for mixed interfaces, protein nucleic acids, or nucleic acid nucleic acids. Hey, hey, good point. So, <clears throat> in fact, we, we we run a few tests, and so it does work also for um, uh, nucleic acids. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Just a small question. I was wondering um, how big can be the, the, the comparison. Do, do you have a, uh, if you, can we compare, for instance, all the spike structures or um, on other topics, uh, many uh, ligand bound uh, protein structures? <clears throat> yeah, so um, uh, look, so everything, once you have computed the interface string, which is essentially the cost of this calculation is that of building the DNA triangulation in the alpha complex. So this is n log n with n the number of atoms. The rest is linear in the number in the size of the strings. So you can pick as many cases as you wish. So now the drawings are getting are likely to be clut cluttered, right? Because if you if you end up, it's like a multiple sequence alignment if it's very big. But of course, if you look at uh, what you have, the, the marginal, namely the, the line at the very bottom, so you, you get a summary of the information. Right, but for example, if you wanted to, to, to inspect specifically to what extent a given amino acid that the interface undergoes changes regarding its secondary structures. So you, you would have to inspect every single uh, uh, polypeptide chain. And so, so this is linear in, in the number of cases you want to compare. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any more questions? Okay, so uh, as planned in the schedule, uh, I think we are going to take a, a short uh, recess, uh, 30 minutes. We are kind of emulating uh, the, the, um, the proverbial coffee break. Um, um, so we are, we'll come back to the meeting in, uh, at, at 11 sharp uh, with a talk by Jean-Philippe Piquemal. And uh, in the meanwhile, um, feel free to have coffee or just take a break so we can really enjoy um, the rest of the of the talks to their fullest. Frederick? Yes. Can I use the opportunity to ask you a few more questions? Of course. Uh, so my question was uh Voronoi Tessellation provides a very compact description of, uh, for example, protein-protein contact. Mm -hmm. And there have been a lot of progress in geometric learning, how to learn on uh, 2D meshes of 3D objects. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there was a very nice application uh, published last year from our, uh, Mike Bronstein and uh, Bruno Carrera on geometric deep learning on uh, protein meshes. Mm -hmm. In principle, this approach, I, I, can, I, can, I can give you all the links. In principle, this approach can be transferred also to the Voronoi presentation. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I, to be honest, I, I, I'm not, try to follow up on this um, vein of research. So again, I think um, one has to 
to specify carefully what, what the goals are, right? Because a mesh, well, are we talking about 2D meshes or 3D meshes here? Uh, this is a 2D manifold of the 3D shape. So they've been able to express the protein docking problem <coughs> as a 2D manifold problem. Mm -hmm. So they've changed a bit the paradigm and it looks a bit like a huge step forward in the protein docking business. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So rigid body docking or flexible docking? Uh, so far rigid body docking, but they are so fast that the next step will be flexible docking. Uh -huh. <coughs> But, but how come it's uh, working so well if it does not, if you not, do not accommodate some... Uh, it doesn't work so well, but it works incredibly fast. No. Yeah. Sergey? Yes. David is speaking here. Uh, what is the main difference between uh, this, uh, this citation and uh, uh, the um, Guillaume Lamoure works about uh, the tor uh, protein torsion, about... Uh, Locations of uh, using uh, uh, using a neural, neural network. Uh, so I I, 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 I don't know. Formulate. I mean, uh, you know that uh, Guillaume Lamoureux, you, you have a you are co-author of, of some paper. Ah yes, I mean uh, the one where <laughs> where I was the co-author. Uh, well, yes. Okay. 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 Uh, My so question is, is it uh, tr very different from, from this? It's very different, yes. So our naive idea of my ex-student was to try to fold and dock things using regular convolutional nets. So you cut a protein or a protein uh, complex into regular cubes and then you run 3D convolutional nets on a regular grid you reusing all the knowledge we have. Uh, it works reasonably well, but it can be improved in many dimensions and directions. On my side, we've been still continuing to explore this idea for irregular 3D tessellation. So my own interest was to use the Voronoi tessellation as a irregular grid representation. Instead of a regular grid, we're trying to use irregular grid based on the Voronoi representations. And we have uh, submitted two preprints uh, this year, so they're already available. Uh, what geometric learning people doing, and there, there was even an ERC project by uh, Mathieu, 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 Mathieu Montes. They are trying to, instead of considering 3D, objects that are trying to, to work on 2D manifolds. Okay, which is conceptually different, which is a much more compact and uh, faster, uh, well, compact representation and faster algorithms. And there have been a very successful implementation by Carrera and Bronstein that reused convolutional neural nets on 2D manifolds such that they could position the kernels on the curved shapes and surfaces. And, uh, there is many features more than, uh, the run, uh, more than that. But um, uh, how do you manage the, the, the uncertainty using the mesh and the Voronoi diagrams? I mean, uh, there is a uncertainty about resolution, so is it more easy to manage this, uh, this uncertainty using mesh or using cube? Uh, it's a good question. As you, as you know, as you know, there is uncertainty about uh, experimental data. You are <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Well, when we're using the uh, 3D representation, we encode each position as a Gaussian blob, and we can play with the resolution of this blob. Yes. When, so this yes. is quite quite clear how to do. When you are using the shape representation, I suppose the uncertainty can be coded with the kernels of different size. You can still play with the position of, of the kernels on this. Yes, Probably you have uh, less flexibility, but still yeah. you can technically you can do it. So there is a there is a simple answer to this question using, in fact, not a Voronoi diagram but the alpha shape. 
because the alpha shape is a one parameter family of shapes. And so what you can do is to, to uh, think about the ball and now the uncertainty will be coded by the radius of the ball, right? Uh, and so, <clears throat> for example, you may say that if there is no uncertainty, you have a small ball. If uh, there is a bigger uncertainty, so the, the radius is getting larger. And so one can even say, okay, so uh, if I don't know what the shape is, I'm going to interpolate between an inner radius and a, an outer radius. And whenever there is a growth process, uh, so parameterized, let's say, by this radius, which is evolved between the lower bound and the upper bound, whenever there is a growth process, there is a Voronoi diagram, and associated with it, there is an alpha shape. Uh, which is uh, coding the contacts between the balls at different scales. And so already 10 years back, we had a couple of papers, uh, I think published in proteins, where we used, in fact, uh, these uh, fancy Voronoi diagrams to encode uncertainties associated to a reconstruction uh, by integration. Uh, Max, for example, knows this uh, very well. So this was uh, after the work by Andre Sally and others on the nuclear power complex. And so we were able to show that, uh, that using these uh, encoding of uncertainties, we could retrieve quite interesting information, in fact. Uh, Frederick, can you combine it with uh, deep learning? Yeah, I think so, because uh, what this uh, construction gives you is, um, is um, what we call um, a filtration. It's a, it's a sequence of nested simplicial complexes, right? And so if you can plug a simplicial complex into deep learning, so you can certainly, certainly play with the one family, family of complexes which are going to, to take this information, this uncertainty information into account, yes. And what about using a topological data analysis for that? But this is in fact, in fact, a filtration. Yeah. A filtration, this is, this is the root of topological data analysis, in fact. I know, I know. <laughs> so this is uh, the, the persistent diagrams, in fact, which are coming uh, along with uh, uh, this uh, nested sequence of alpha shapes, this is what the persistence is encoding, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. I think I'll try to profit from some coffee. Okay, so me too. I'll be back at uh, mm -hmm. on time.